Located in the centre of the capital city of Wales, Cardiff Castle is a medieval castle and Victorian Gothic revival mansion. The site of a Roman fort, the Normans built a castle here around 1090 and during Victorian times, the third Marquis of Butte, arguably the richest man in the world, transformed the walls and towers of this grade one listed building. Cardiff Castle is arguably the most haunted building in the capital. Here are some of the stories from this impressive and opulent landmark. Today, Cardiff is a glossy city, well known for shopping, culture, its university and its waterside developments. In Victorian times, Castle Street and Duke Street, directly outside the main entrance of the castle, were major commercial streets and thoroughfares, transporting goods and people across the city by horse-drawn coaches and trams. It seems one horse-drawn coach refuses to leave. A phantom coach, pulled by four black horses, has been seen many times. It races over Canton Bridge, past the Animal Wall and Butte Park on Castle Street, hurtles along towards the gatehouse, where it makes a sharp left turn and enters the castle. It was witnessed in 1956 by a man named David Brecken, who wrote about his experience in a newspaper article for Empire News. He reported that he was walking past the castle one cold and frosty night in January. He heard from the direction of Canton Bridge ahead of him the distinct jingle of a harness, the clatter of horses' hooves, the sounds of bells and a coachman's cry. The coach emerged from the darkness and swung left into the castle gateway and disappeared from sight. The phantom coach has been heard from within the castle itself. On November the 10th, 1868, John Boyle, a trustee for the family living at the castle, was in the castle library. He heard the sounds of a coach and horses enter through the castle gateway. He asked the butler who was visiting the castle at such a late hour, but he was told no coach had recently arrived. That night, Boyle was informed that a member of the Hastings family had died, a family that had marital connections to the second Marquis of Butte. It seems the arrival of the spectral carriage is an omen, foretelling of the death of a family member. Lady Margaret McRae, the only daughter of the third Marquis of Butte, heard the phantom coach and horses at Cardiff Castle on the 8th of October 1900. That night, at Dumfries House in Scotland, her father died. The second Marquis of Butte was a very wealthy industrialist and aristocrat in Georgian and Victorian Britain. He was ambitious, developed land estates for maximum return and played a central role in the creation of Cardiff docks. He knew that with the right investment, 
Cardiff could be transformed into a major port for exporting the lucrative coal and iron in South Wales. He was right, and the port became one of the largest dock systems in the world. At its peak, in 1913, 10.7 million tonnes of coal were exported from the port. Bute had four major seats, Mount Stuart House on the Isle of Bute, Dumfries House in Ayrshire, Luton Hoo in Bedfordshire and Cardiff Castle. He preferred to reside at Mount Stuart House and only lived at Cardiff Castle for a few weeks of the year. He married twice. His first wife, Lady Maria, died in 1841 after several illnesses. Bute blamed his obsession with building the Cardiff docks as contributing to her rapid demise. They didn't have any children, but in 1845, he remarried to Lady Sophia Hastings. They had one son together, born in 1847. Some authors have described Sophia as obsessive, hard to please, and unable to get on with John's family. Bute died at Cardiff Castle on the 18th of March, 1848, after a lavish banquet. He died suddenly and unexpectedly at the age of 54 in his dressing room, a small chamber behind the library we see today. During redevelopment, the area was turned into a chapel. Occasionally, the second Marquis of Butte appears in the library near the fireplace. During his time, this was a doorway. He then passes through a thick stone wall to a corridor and then through another wall into the chapel. A white marble bust of the second Marquis of Butte stands opposite the altar, bearing the words fell asleep and awoke in eternity. The second Marquis appeared most notably in 1976, when a young couple told the castle custodian of an odd experience they'd had when entering the chapel. They reported that a tall man in a cloak pushed past them in a great hurry. The custodian mentioned this to the chief architect the following day. She had also witnessed a tall figure in a red cloak while she'd been stood at the top of the stairs. The man seemed to be scowling at her and then vanished. The figure matched the man in a nearby painting, a portrait of the second Marquis of Butte. On the 1st of April, 1848, thousands of people in Cardiff lined the streets to see Butte make his final journey he was buried with his first wife. At Butte docks, guns sounded every minute, shops and offices were closed, and the ships in the docks had their colours at half-mast. His lead-lined coffin was made of Spanish mahogany. The inside was adorned with rich crimson silk velvet. Perhaps the people of Cardiff wanted to say a final farewell to a man who brought so much advancement employment and change to the city. After the death of the second Marquis of Butte, the castle passed into the hands of his son, John. He transformed the castle, using his vast wealth to renovate in the Gothic Revival style under English architect and designer William Burgess. The banqueting hall is located in one of the oldest parts of the castle, dating back to the 15th century. The ceilings, floors and interiors were added much later, in 1873, and the room was designed to look like a medieval banqueting hall. It's where the third Marquis of Butte would hold lavish banquets and entertain guests. The room, like so many at Cardiff Castle, 
with its ornate carvings and opulent designs, is truly breathtaking. Mysterious footsteps have been heard in the banqueting hall when nobody is around. Items in the room have been moved and rearranged by a mysterious woman dressed in a flowing grey or white dress. Some say this apparition doesn't have a face, and she has been seen both inside and outside of the castle. Nobody knows who she is. The figure of a man has been seen many times in the banqueting hall. In 1975, a custodian named Derek Edwards, who'd worked at the castle for around 12 months, was in the process of clearing up after a lunch function. He saw the figure of a man in the doorway at the far end of the hall. He approached the man and asked, Can I help you, sir? The man turned around and began to fade away. Initially, the man is seen as a solid apparition and he's been spotted in bedrooms where apparent poltergeist activity has taken place. Nobody is certain who the man is, but some say this could be the apparition of a chef named Paul who died very suddenly at the castle many years ago. One evening, in October 1892, the chef, whilst descending a stone staircase, collapsed and fell to the bottom and landed on his side. He was unconscious and bleeding. The butler tried to assist him, as he was still alive, as did Lord Bute's valet, who called for a doctor. After 20 minutes, Dr Evans arrived, but sadly it was too late. He declared that the chef had expired. Lord Bute ordered the body to be taken to a room adjacent to the hall to await an inquest. It was revealed that Paul had died from a heart attack at the age of 52. His family in France were contacted. Sadly, he had only worked at the castle for a few weeks and was held in high regard. Could this sad and unexpected death be linked to the man seen in the vicinity of the banqueting hall and the bedrooms? Lord and Lady Bute had four children, and this room, designed by William Burgess, was used as their day nursery. The children were looked after by nursery maids, a governess and a nurse. The children were taught to speak Welsh and French. The nursery is one of the most paranormally active areas of the entire castle. In broad daylight, people have witnessed dense grey mist moving across from the ornate fireplace towards the windows. Children's laughter has been heard when there are no children present. But it seems that the nursery is home to poltergeist activity. The doll has been seen to blink and has been found elsewhere, not just in the nursery, but in other parts of the castle. It has been found in the nursery, sitting sideways, with its feet under the armrests of the seat. The antique rocking horse has also started rocking by its own accord and has moved from its current location to elsewhere in the room, including across the doorway. Many visitors have felt overwhelmed in this room and have started sobbing uncontrollably. The atmosphere can feel oppressive and people can feel faint and unwell here. Children on school trips have felt something blow in their ear and the sound of mysterious whistling that adults, it seems, can't hear. It seems this room in the castle may be harbouring a dark entity, and this perhaps originated in the clock tower. The castle has several towers. The Black Tower, just at the gateway of the castle, has a dark past. It has a 13th century dungeon where several religious martyrs were held captive in the 16th and 17th centuries before being put to death. Sadly, the dungeon itself isn't open to the public, but records show that prisoners were held here before public execution. 
the gallows were located at the site of Cardiff Market today. The dungeon at Cardiff Castle was so awful, prisoners became very ill and were said to have the dreaded jail fever, which lurked in these dark and noisome dens of filth and disease. Dozens of people died here, having spent their last days shackled in irons. Some prisoners, such as rebellion leader Llewellyn Bren, were executed within the castle itself. In the castle's clock tower are two smoking rooms, locations for the gentlemen of the household to relax after dinner with cigars, drinks and play cards. At the bottom of the tower is the winter smoking room. The heavy wooden door is covered with beautiful detail and the door frame is surrounded by perfectly painted birds. This small room has walls and a ceiling covered in exquisite artwork depicting zodiac symbols and gods and goddesses. Despite the ornate decor, could there be a more mysterious side of this room? Both Lord Bute and William Burgess were fascinated with the idea of the zodiac, astrology and the unknown. Lord Bute invited spiritualist mediums to the castle to try and contact the dead. Experiments to attempt to prove the existence of ghosts were conducted in this room. The results of such experiments have been lost to time. Just outside of the entrance is a devil's face. This was apparently installed to keep the women away. Could it represent a more sinister side to this exquisite yet mysterious room? Could the dark entity haunting the nursery perhaps have been unleashed in here? Over 100 steps take you to the top of the tower and the location of the summer smoking room. This room has possibly the most exquisite decor in the entire castle. The magnificent domed ceiling is painted with stars located above a beautiful sun chandelier. The floor features the legends of the Zodiac painted in 1874. This room was used occasionally by Lord Bute, but today it is sometimes used by paranormal groups. Whether their investigations are successful, we don't know, but there is a resident ghost who occasionally makes an appearance here. It is thought that this is the third Marquis of Butte himself. He is witnessed looking out of the windows, gazing at the beautiful castle he worked so hard to transform. He also looks across the sweeping views of Cardiff, the city he and his family worked so hard to shape and develop, bringing him immense wealth, a family and a beautiful castle. Directly across the road from Cardiff Castle is the Rummer Tavern, one of the oldest trading pubs in the city centre. Its first licence was granted in 1713 and it's a narrow oak bean pub with an interesting past. In September 1891, just outside the pub's entrance, a man named George Hadley, aged 53, died somewhat unexpectedly. He was on duty on Duke Street, cleaning one of the street lamps, standing on a ladder. As he cleaned, a roof tile fell and struck his head. He toppled off the ladder and sadly later died at the Cardiff Royal Infirmary. In 1840, the pub was the starting point of the coach service from Cardiff to Worcester and Birmingham, linking Cardiff with important locations elsewhere in the UK. In 1845, the landlord of the pub was accused of keeping the pub open until half past one on a Sunday morning. In 1877, Henry Bird, a labourer, was found guilty of stealing six shillings from the till whilst the landlady had left the bar. He was sentenced to a month in prison 
with hard labour. The Roma Tavern was a popular watering hole with mariners arriving at the bustling Cardiff docks. In 1888, Henry Lewis, aged 50, and Michael Rainey, aged 37, both worked as ship's painters and were drinking at the pub when a quarrel broke out. Both men worked at Mount Stewart Dry Docks, and it seems the company they worked for were making people redundant, and only one of them would remain in employment. Each felt they were the worthiest to stay employed. Henry Lewis returned to the ship, and a few hours later, Rainey followed. In the time that had passed, Lewis had successfully received the contract to work and was engaged in the hold of the ship. Michael Rainey was absolutely outraged and boarded the vessel, shouting for Lewis to come up onto the deck to fight it out. Lewis emerged, words were exchanged and Lewis, fed up of Rainey's behaviour, threw a punch that struck Rainey. Lewis began his descent back down into the hold. As he stepped down the ladder, Rainey exploded and kicked Lewis in the face. He fell backwards off the ladder into the hold, a considerable depth where he sustained serious injuries. A doctor was called for and upon his arrival, Lewis was declared dead. He left a wife and seven children. Michael Rainey left the ship but was quickly apprehended by the police at Junction Yard. The case went to court, where Rainey argued that Lewis had simply fallen from the ladder. However, it was decided that the kick was delivered in retaliation for the blow administered by Lewis, and it was not carried out with the intention to kill him. The jury decided a verdict of manslaughter, and Rainey was taken to Cardiff Prison. The Rummer Tavern is well known for its paranormal activity that bizarrely seems to centre on the men's toilets. People feel they are being watched, see movement behind them when they look in the mirror and generally feel the toilets have an oppressive atmosphere. Mediums have picked up on the energy of an angry sailor and some say the haunting is that of a man who returned from sea to find that his wife had taken a lover. Angry and upset, He murdered the lover before taking his own life. Perhaps the pub is haunted by the bitter figure of Michael Rainey, seething from the quarrel he had with his friend before murdering him. Could he be responsible for the hauntings at the Rummer Tavern? If you've, if you've made it this far in the video, I just want to say thank you. And I just want to share with you a couple of small experiences and thoughts about Cardiff Castle and the Rummer Tavern. So I was brought up in Cardiff and that's where I lived for many, many years. And the Rummer Tavern was the sort of place that um, you might go to on a Friday night or a Saturday before heading on to perhaps some of the nightclubs in Cardiff. It was a, a, a well-known watering hole before you went on to other places, I suppose. Uh, One of my friends, I must have been about 19 at the time, he would have been about the same age, he said that he was in the Rummer Tavern and he was there with a couple of his mates and they were, this was before the time of the smoking ban in the UK, and they were sat at the bar and he said they watched a cigarette packet do three quite pronounced sort of jolts along the bar as if someone had flicked it when nobody had touched it. Now obviously I wasn't there so I can't really say whether this is true or not but it's a bit of an odd story. I think the mediums that have been into the Rummer Tavern will all agree that the spirit is that of something or a person that is very unpleasant. That's the 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 feeling I get from what I've read and what I've heard. But the nursery at Cardiff Castle is a place that even today I still have a bit of apprehension about going into that, ro- into that room. We used to go on school trips there. Um, it was quite common in the late 80s and early 90s that you do a history trip to Cardiff Castle. So I went there 
in, I think it was 1989, and my friend, in the we were in the nursery, my friend stood next to me, Rhiannon. She fainted, and I nothing particularly peculiar about that. But I remember it because she hit her head quite spectacularly on a wooden chair. And I'll never forget that noise, that thudding, sort of hollow noise. I can still hear it now. It was absolutely awful. And for some time, she had quite significant bruising and swelling. And she really looked like she'd been walloped in the face, which she hadn't. But I, I remember that. Um, but I don't think we can say that that's anything paranormal or particularly uh, unexplainable. About two years later, um, I went on a school trip to Cardiff Castle again. And I was in the nursery with uh, my classmates. We must have been about 25 of us. There must have been about 25 of us, I think, in the, in the nursery at the time. And there was a boy in my class. His name was Anthony. He was a really tall boy for his age. I would say he must have gone through his growth spurt at, the, at a young age. He was certainly significantly taller than me. And we used to call him Big Ben because he was so tall. And we were listening to the guide in the nursery. He was talking about um, the, the various paintings and the stories connected with them on the wall there. And Anthony, from nowhere, just felt completely flat on his face. It was the strangest thing. He didn't trip, trip up or sort of stumble forward. He wasn't pushed. And he, he didn't put his wrist out or anything like that, as you would. He just went straight down on his face. And how he didn't break his nose, I really do not know. So we all tried to help Anthony up. And it was only as we were sort of... Sort of around him trying to help him that we realized on the back of his head he had a cut it was a cut about a centimeter in length and it was really nasty quite a deep cut and it was bleeding he was bleeding everywhere in fact he had a white rugby shirt on at the time and there was it was covered in blood and i remember thinking oh my god what the hell's happened to to anthony and we we, we managed to get him up but he had to go and have stitches he had to have i think it was five or six stitches at the cardiff royal infirmary but when he was lying on the floor, completely unconscious with this awful cut, we realised that next to him there was a pound coin. Now, if you're familiar with British pound coins or, and, and um, currency, a pound coin doesn't have sharp edges. It's not a coin like a 50p piece with any straight sides. Whether or not a pound coin can inflict a wound like that on somebody's head, I, I find that hard to believe. But it was there and it was next to him. It's still a mystery to, to this day. If you were going to try and cut somebody's head with a, with a coin, I suppose the only way you could really do it is by maybe throwing it with some serious force, I suppose. It's weird. I, to this day, I cannot tell you how that poor boy ended up with a nasty cut, lying face down in the nursery at Cardiff Castle and needing stitches. It's very, very odd, but it happened. And I hope, Anthony, if you are around still, hope you're well. But... It's puzzling. I cannot explain that. So I just thought I'd let you know about that. Please have a look at Cardiff Castle's website. They've got some lovely videos where you can go in and have a look around some of the other rooms that we didn't cover in this video today. Anyway, thank you for listening.